Welcome to Boston Music Explorer. I'm Dan. I'm Jack. And we're, we're the, the Barton, Barton Brothers. Brothers. We're songwriters and performers that are newly based in Boston. This podcast is our excuse to talk to people who are doing interesting things in the Boston music scene. If you're doing something cool, we want to hear about it. If you like what you hear and want to send some love to the algorithm gods, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And enjoy this episode of Boston, Boston Music Explorer. Explorer. Hello. Uh, Dan here, back with another episode of Boston Music Explorer, episode 10, to be exact. It's our first mini milestone, and to celebrate, we took the show on the road. So Boston Music Explorer is less of a rule and more of a guideline. Wasn't that a line in in, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean? It's parlay. It's less of a rule and more of a guideline. Uh, anyways, okay, I'll keep this intro short uh, because this chat is so interesting. Last week, Jack and I were in Nashville for the CD Baby DIY Musician Conference, which was a lovely time despite the heat. Uh, we had gone the year prior as well, and since there was a decent amount of repeat content, it was a good benchmark to measure ourselves against a year later. Um as far as the repeat content goes, that makes sense. I don't know how many ways you can tell an independent artist not to, to be lazy and to have cool merch and that YouTube is important. Uh, nonetheless, it was way worthwhile, and this episode is one of the main reasons why. Uh, we met Genesia last year in Nashville when we were still Barton and Barton, and they were still Soapbox Duo. Just as a quick background, uh, the former Soapbox duo is made up of Alexander and Janessa, who are a married couple out of Edmonton, Canada. Uh, They were previously making kind of like indie jazzy folk music, and you can hear us talk about their decision to change their style and their name, Uh, but they kind of ran up against a wall with that and wanted to start making more uh, pop-driven music, and that's when they changed their name to Janessia. You can hear that debut EP under the new name everywhere online. It's called Catch-22. They are super talented and delightful people, so we've been following them throughout the year, and we're excited to chat about their name change and rebrand and their new music, as well as how they make it work as full-time musicians. Uh, Jack and I are both scaling down our day jobs, so we're anxious to hear from people who are uh, making it work. On top of that, they have the most fascinating, dramatic Hollywood stories behind how they've gotten to where they are today. And I told them this, but like with anybody's Instagram version of a career, their life looks enviable and polished and impressive, and you will not believe what they've pushed through to uh, be able to wake up today and keep making music. Uh, Understandably, we did not fly our studio down to Nashville, so this episode was just recorded on a little handheld task cam in the living room of their Airbnb, which will account for uh, the difference in sound quality once I turn this off. We start the episode uh, talking about Tom Jackson, who is a live music producer and uh, spoke at the conference, and he has a, a fascinating guy that has a lot of things to say about making an interesting show, having a great set list, putting on a great performance. So we're going to jump in the conversation uh, kind of at the tail end of our discussion about him. Wait until the end. You can hear their performances of their songs Catch-22 and Mexico. Uh, that'll be on our YouTube channel shortly if you want to see the video. And uh, I will leave it at that. You can find them at Genesia everywhere online, J-E-N-E-S-I-A, geneciamusic.com. Check the show notes, pass this along if you dig it, and we'll talk to you soon. Just to decide what material you're going to include or how you're going to arrange your songs differently, um, we did a, we hosted our first ever, like we rented a theater and did like a whole big concert. And so that was... I think we had just over 200 people out. Um, And we wanted, because we had a lot of people coming that have heard us play numerous times. We're like, well, we have a few new songs, but a lot of it's stuff they've heard. So how do we make it interesting? And that, I really went back to that. And we ended up, because we were so boxed to us still at the time, we ended up actually building a platform 
that looked like a big soapbox that we were standing on. Oh, cool. And we had a flash mob of people come from the audience and sing like a big chorus with us. And we've done a lot of like moments things yeah. Yeah. that was all inspired by his concepts yeah. and his methodology. So that is super interesting. That sort of thing. Like that's, those are memorable things. That's really outside the, outside the box and on top of the box. Well, right. so, we tried it rolling, right? Yeah. I just like set it rolling to yeah. warm up and these are really interesting things, but we can back up really yeah, quickly. Let's back up to the beginning. A we little are bit. Uh, here talking to Genesia today. So formerly Soapbox Duo, we will go over like all of those transitions because it's really interesting to us. But welcome <laughs> to the remote podcast. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks so much Thank for having you. us. Yeah. So back up to the uh, beginning a little bit. I know you guys have a pretty extensive history together. How did you guys meet? We met like four or five years ago. Five years ago in two weeks. Yeah. September 2013 because it was our second year in university and we didn't know each other first year uh, we met and we became friends real fast good musical chemistry yeah. and like we both felt like we admired each other the most out of all of our classmates musically and we just were started working together a lot and then we both had to learn piano for one of our courses and like I don't know anything about piano so I was like, hey, Jen, why don't we like practice piano together in like this private wanger every <laughs> afternoon? And we didn't do a lot of practicing, but we did lots of talking. Nice. I think that's what really bonded us. Then she was like, I want to read this new book. Hey, like, let's read this book together. And then we'd spend more private time in the classroom just like going over this book. It was like a book analysis sort of thing, right? It's called Purpose Driven Life. And it was just oh, talking yeah, about course. like... Yeah, just because we were going to be finishing university, and it's like, I was feeling pretty discouraged from my first year. So it's a really critical environment. Um, and as, like, an empath and, like, a, a sensitive personality, I was really struggling, like, should I, should I still do this, or should I just do something else? And so that book was helpful, just talking about, like, what experiences from your life make you unique, and, you know, how do you use that to help change other people's lives and, and your own life? And... Uh, what do you want from life? And like, where are you going? What are your passions? So we so talked about like, we're talking deep, all deep the time. Stuff. And now we're like answering all these life questions. And yeah. Zero like, to 100. Things are like, really like, we're the same type of person. Yeah. And you know, just advanced from there. So we dated for five months and then I proposed. We got married five months later. So it was like, oh, because we were like well, on an advanced track. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> We like spent so much time together and we got to know each other really well. And yeah. when you know, you know. Yeah. Worst advice, but the best advice ever. Totally. This is true. Yeah, it just sounds cliche, but... So were you guys married at the point that you started performing together? Well, or did we, you start performing like pretty much right on? We, yeah, we had, in, like, to, school. we had to work together yeah. in school, so yeah. we did that. But then uh, our first gig as Soapbox Duo was like four days after, three days after we got engaged. Right. Something like that. Because I had come, I yeah. come up with the concept of the brand while we were in school. Okay. And so we, we finished April, he proposed May, and then we had our first show. So it all kind of tied together. Cool. So, yeah, it's like, it's all very in sync, that, the, the, gen the genesis of all that. So you were then Soapbox Duo for how many years? Up until May 12th of... This 2018. All right, very cool. So that's so very recent. That's cool. That's a long time. Three three years under that name, yeah. And yeah. you know, say like reverse six months, and we were talking to Soapbox Duo. Like, what was your elevator pitch for yourselves? And uh, yeah, what was your what was your brand at that point? <laughs> uh, our brand at that point was like people would be like, "Oh, why are you Soapbox?" We're like because we want to use our music as a platform uh, to inspire ourselves and others toward the pursuit of justice. Cool. You know, like that idea, you'd stand on your soapbox right, in the street exactly. corner. So like, because people did that in the forties, yeah. our brand was like forties. So I wore pants with suspenders and she wore dresses Yeah. and like everything was old and vintage, whatever we could do, mm -hmm. which was extremely limiting. We found when looking for merch mm -hmm. and like buying products, like, 
we thought, you know, our brand is like pretty strict on being vintage. So yeah. we found it very limiting. And that was one of the reasons we decided to change. Yeah. Because she's like, I hate wearing dresses all the time. I just wear right. pants. <laughs> I want to be a rock star that just wears like ripped jeans and sometimes yeah. like, yeah. I want to write a pop song. Like, what's. Exactly. Okay, so like you kind of like, you know, you really like. Because what I remember seeing you guys uh, first at the BB King's open mic night at Seed Baby last year, and it. It was definitely very on brand. Like you guys definitely had a very tight package. So did you feel like you got the most out of that that you could, and you wanted to explore the things, and it just like wasn't fitting what you were communicating? Yeah, I mean, That's we liked it so it. much, and we had lots of fun being soapbox duo. But it was we hit a ceiling. Yeah, we hit a ceiling locally, and then we hit a ceiling when we started looking like where do we want to be in five years. Um, do we want to do the folk circuit? Do we want to be playing house concerts and you know, s- you know, slowly building that way and and targeting a, a, a older demographic? For sure. Um, Is that was that your experience? Like older people were most yes, yes. really okay. Time. okay. Absolutely. And people thought for sure we were folk because of the duo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Name. Even though our music, the way we write, we write. We don't write in in folk form. We've got A A A or A V A V. We we have a very pop sort of pattern. To and it's aggressive. Songs. It is like punch you in the face. Right. Just because of her voice, it's very strong. And we're not like soft. And I don't play like the simple chords. Right. Uh, really, yeah. yeah. Nail it as hard as I can, and yeah, make it really very complicated. Dynamic. So we were getting booked for like folk festivals and things like that locally, and we'd go out to them. And everyone would be listing off, you know, all their favorite folk artists, and we couldn't relate because it's not a genre we, we listen to a lot. Those were your influences, right? Right. Yeah. right. So um, we kind of felt a little like out of place in, in that circle, uh-huh. as well as our music felt like I wasn't as drawn to, you know, stay at the festival for an extra day to hear everybody. Um, and and I think maybe those people might have felt that way toward our music too, right. like. Well, they look cool, but their music is isn't quite what we're doing here. And so, also, we we got some feedback on you know how people felt toward the name because we were wondering why we were we were wondering why we were running into certain limitations. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if I can describe it concisely, but somebody brought up like, oh, your your name has duo in it, so people assume that you only ever play together. Uh-huh. And that it's like that boy girl cuteness. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rather than us having something like a band or right. And now we and then it would be weird if we're playing with a band, right? Like we should book stool, but not like we are the duo. We just have other players. Oh, yeah, but it yeah. just didn't work. Right. Huh. And people just automatically had an idea of what we would sound like because of the word duo. Okay. And then soapbox, we found we thought it was very positive because it was like. In, in the early 1900s, people were rallied together. There wasn't social media, there wasn't a way to connect people. So you literally had to stand up and shout to get people together on, you know, changing workplace safety and just important things, right? Um, but a lot of people that are older or like m- middle aged, maybe, um, they were often seeing it as like the, you know, you go downtown in the city that you live in and there's somebody who's like mentally unstable out there shouting at people or the like, guys that wear like the big placard thing is like jesus is coming right. like doom yeah. blue. <laughs> right it's synonymous with being like preachy at yeah. this point. right yeah. and, and like yeah aggressive and non-open and you know that sort of yeah. thing and then the people our age like 20s saw it as like ranting because people are like oh I'm on my soapbox on social media that was a term that it was like just a name on my soapbox yeah, for a minute yeah. right exactly interesting okay and then the young people who we really want to connect to because we feel like we have a lot to share with them um, about overcoming like childhood trauma and stuff they don't even know what the word soapbox means at all right <laughs> so they're like what is it what is soapbox like, we're like like a box that used to carry stuff in and they they, they flip it over and they're they're like, oh, okay, you know? So it was just... An uphill battle in every demographic. Right. It was was causing all these limitations. People would just read the name. Just from the name. Yeah. And then they wouldn't be interested in checking out the music. Right. For whatever reason. But you know what you can't judge? You can't judge a person's name. Right. Like Genesia. Yeah. That is like... Nothing. Nothing. Right. Exactly. 
Well, before we dive into the rebrand totally, uh, I remember when we met last year, you, uh, we talked a little bit about this idea that a lot of people have that you're working a full-time job and then you're doing music as well and you're kind of hoping that as the music builds, you can kind of wean yourself off of work as your career builds. But you said you had an interesting experience, uh, something medically with work, if I remember, mm. and that was kind of a, the kick in the pants mm, yeah. to get you to, to quit your job. And h- how do you feel about... I'll talk a little bit about that and then how that has changed your career path. I think a lot of people think that they can like slowly wean off work and like build their music career, but that doesn't happen very often because like how do you only work like three hours at your job or something? You know what I mean? Like you have to be pretty consistent. So when you cut it out, you're left with this huge gap in like making money and like that's what we were faced with. Because Jen was, what was the whole story? Uh, that's when I was working for a company called CLAC. Fantastic company, best job that you could ask for, pension and all that stuff. Right. Uh, but I, yeah, I started getting these weird episodes where my heart rate would just go like 180 and uh, I'd be like on the floor in my cubicle and they had to call an ambulance like Jeez. multiple times and I, but lose part of my vision and my, my tongue would be flaccid in my mouth and it was just weird like just wow. and so I went through about six weeks of medical testing like multiple ECGs halter monitors to see if they could track if, they, if I had an arrhythmia of some sort and stress tests which they don't give people under 40 um, all this crazy stuff and uh, at the end of it they were like everything is really looking good so the only thing that we can think it is is like panic attacks and i was like i don't feel like panicky about anything like we had a lot on our plates that's the thing she had a full-time job i had a full-time job in the trades which was sometime went overtime and then we were teaching music every night and we were performing and building our career so box duo so it was just a lot of work yeah working all the time and working and late build like subconsciously that's I don't feel thing. stressed but it's your body like she's the like new a normal. business yeah. person right so she's like holding a lot of the weight right where i can like like i think a lot of guys are Two like years. this we can put things in a box compartment <laughs> later <laughs> well that has to take a toll on like not to mention that you're married like so like that takes a toll on right. a business creativity on a relationship on a day job all that stuff starts to like compound for sure so yes. that was your so you quit your job after that, right? And that I was... did, I did. I It was a hard decision for me, but I felt like, you know what? I'm going to work on, because we had our music teaching business at the time with about 45 students, Holy another teacher, and, and the two of us. Okay. So I was like, I'll focus on that and work on just trying to get us more bookings and, and work on our, our music stuff. And that was September. And I mean, I had a job still, so we were totally good. Yeah. Except that I lost my job oh, in January. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, um, Alberta has been really struggling. They've been trying to reform our energy sector just to make it more, you know, So we should say you guys are based in Edmonton. Is that yeah, right? yeah, okay, Edmonton, cool. And that's an oil town, man. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's literally industrial. called Oil City. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, and we, we were, the probably still are, but in transition away from it, the, the, one of the wealthiest provinces in the, in the country right. because of our resources. And right. so a lot of times people from the east will move over there just to, just to get work and stuff. Um, but they started changing like carbon taxes and they started making our resources more expensive so we couldn't compete in the global market. So nobody wanted to invest here, nobody wanted to buy. So we had like entire uh, sectors shutting down. We still have that happening. Like We lost 100,000 jobs. In like a year. That's insane. So yeah, it's like at the forefront of everything that's changing globally, you it's like the epicenter is Edmonton right now. So Exactly. And you know, like his job, he was installing windows yeah. and doors. Like but that's the trickle not down, oil. you know? Right. Like it, it affects yeah. everything. Everybody. Even even as a performing artist. Yeah. The first Christmas after all of that stuff was happening, yeah. people couldn't afford companies couldn't afford Christmas parties. So we went into the season like, oh, this is like, you know, this yeah. is where we make some good money. Cash cow, yeah. And like, nobody was booking. We had so few opportunities. Yeah. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just us. So people were 
putting to doing music lessons, anything extracurricular because their families couldn't afford it. If you didn't lose your job, you had either a pay cut or uh, hours were decreased. Yeah. I, I didn't know anyone whose job wasn't affected. Yeah. In in the whole province. So, so simultaneously you both were we, jobless. Yeah, and we're like, let's do it. This is like, this is our time. This is like a sign, you know? Mm-hmm. So we started teaching a lot and performing a lot, and we, we were doing really good. You know, 50% of our income was coming from teaching and then 50% from performing. And then we reached another wall where we're like, what do we want to do? Do we want to keep going? Because we're kind of at like a wall. We're making a lot from teaching and a lot from performing, and both businesses are growing. We have to either reduce one or cut one out. Right. So we decided the next year that we would cut out teaching because we were traveling a lot for Soapbox Duo. Like coming to this conference would be like a week, and then you got to make up all those lessons throughout the months, you know? Or totally. hire somebody else in, so you're losing that income. It's just complicated, so we decided to cut it out. And then we were again at the place where like 50% of our income is gone now and now we have to work and it's hard to build. You guys have replaced 50% of your income like three times. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. so how long has that been now? Three years. Right? Okay. Like two years? Well. Full time. Last June is when we stopped teaching. So it's been. So it's been full time music career. Right? It was just, oh that's right. But we've been doing was, music full time. Yeah. Um, it'll be three years in, in January. Cool. So once you started doing full time performing, did you notice uh, like a stress increase? Like with just now, this has to be one hundred percent, or was it like a nice kick in the pants? Or how did how did you react to that? I'd say like nice kick in the pants, but also stressful. Yeah. And then like the learning curve, realizing how much work goes into being a DIY musician, like so much computer stuff. And we are not computer people, but we've had to become computer people now. Yeah. Uh, signing up for all these organizations and being part of like all the awards places and like, oh my gosh, it's just so hard to describe. You know what it's like. There's yeah. so many things to look out for. Yeah, like all of a sudden, well, I guess I am learning to be a video editor because I'm not yeah. to like, it's all these things that you like pick up along the way because like that nobody tells you about. Like, well, this professional artist has like sweet videos and all these amazing pictures and a great Instagram and yeah. they, like you said they're applying for all these contests and awards like that doesn't just happen so do you guys uh, ship out for any of that stuff like video editing and stuff like that or have you gotten competent to the point that you do just about everything we definitely have a, a, like a director that we are in love with his name is Justin Brunel his company is Moving Artistry Productions um, we partnered with him in somebody else's project it was a, a web series pilot um, that was funded by TELUS, and we, he just was like, I love your music, and he's such a nice guy, and we just got along real well. And so uh, we hire him, but he's really blessed us with, like, he's been running his own business for a long time, he's, he's young, but he's, he started early and just is extremely gifted, so he can charge an insane rate. Uh, back at home for pretty much anything else. And you guys um, get the friends and family discount. Or yeah, like uh -huh. your guys' military paid them like some tens of thousands of dollars oh, yeah, for like right. filming oh, some of their oh, stuff. Oh, smokes. So like for us, to, for him to even do anything with us is uh, pretty sweet. So um, we have his help for that. Um, we've had just people come alongside us who've been like, oh, you know, let me help you with a marketing strategy. And Planet Sound has... We, we won a competition called My United Way Voice. Yeah. And Planet Sound puts that contest on, so we got connected with them, and then they've been really helpful to us. Um, there's a booking agent in Edmonton who's, you know, really supported us, helped us, you know, write reference letters for grants. And so there's, nothing is exclusive. We have no agreements with them. Um, the only and no one's doing anything for free. Right. No. no. Yeah. The only person that we have that's like a signed, had a signed contract with was our consultant here in Nashville, um, who would help us like month to month. We do like a one hour conference call and we chat about, you know, where we're at with music, what, what we're doing, um, what our opportunities are like. Uh, yeah. And 
that's a that's a hired thing as well. Mm-hmm. So we have to cover the costs of yeah. of that. And we hired an attorney last year and it's <laughs> we've done a lot in the last year as far as like trying to build our, our that's team. That's some pretty grown up stuff, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh it's been a huge challenge. But you know, you always grow through challenges. Yeah. Has that been a huge like clarifying thing to have a consultant that every month you can check in and like have an outside party because you guys are so deep in it together. Mm-hmm. Like you can't even like, it's not like I can go to my girlfriend and talk to someone who has nothing to do with music and mm-hmm. have like, so you guys need uh, like, as much as anybody real outside perspective. Like talk about how you came across your consultant and what that has provided you in the last year. We met him actually at the DIY musician conference. Um, he had a small table, nothing fancy, no big banners or anything like that. Um, and I was walking around, I was supposed to be in a session, but I was late for it, and I was like, meh, I'm just gonna walk around the booths. And uh, he started asking asking me questions about like what we do, and we were about to go film a documentary in Haiti with mm-hmm. a director friend, um, and it was like a huge financial investment for us. And he was like, well, you know, maybe we can look at getting some sponsorships. He's like, he just had like a bunch of ideas like right off the bat, and he believed in what we were talking about. Um, well, I guess it was just me at the time. Um, and so he seems to kind of get us, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so we started talking about like what we were all about. And one of the things that the biggest thing that we're passionate about is the prevention of child sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. And so I had kind of mentioned that to him. And he was like, oh, like, have you ever thought of like performing in schools and stuff? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to, but I have no idea how to go about that here in Canada or back in Canada. And it just opened up, I guess, a lot of cool ideas just in a short conversation. And so we were here a couple extra days after the conference. And so we went and met with him at his office and he had done a bunch of research on us and a lot of consultants we've paid in Canada. You get together with them. They haven't listened to our, our music. Right. It's just, it's literally like, they get paid by the hour. Right. How and many so, can I put in a day? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. It, it has felt like that a lot of times for us um, in those sessions. They might have some helpful information, but a lot of times it just it feels like they just don't care about what we're doing. And this person, uh, Vinny Rebus of Indie Connect, did really care about us. Um, and so we decided to partner with him. And there, there was an opportunity to tour um, in America that presented itself uh, in September when we got home. Um, and unfortunately, like it was going to be like really decent pay, 38 weeks. Um, we had a contract, our lawyer looked over it. It was all, we, we did revisions back and forth. It was clear. We bought travel stuff. We bought banners. We had like everything ready to go. And then five weeks before we were supposed to leave, um, it, it was canceled. The whole tour. Yeah. Holy smokes. Due to like a previous SEC um, investigation and, and, and settlement with an executive director involved in the tour. So. Uh, were there, how many artists were going to be on this? 16. Tour? Okay. Yeah. Jeez, that is a huge That's blow. Wild. Yeah. It is huge. Uh, yeah, it was months and thousands of dollars of prep. And then not only that, but. This is, I think it was December 4th, Dece- November 30th, we found, we, we got a cease and desist letter from a partnering, like a merged company that said they were pulling out. Um, and then December 4th, we had like a big conference call with all the other musicians and everybody from Canada and United States. And um, that's when we were like out. And that, as you guys know, the way that it works with booking gigs booking festivals, um, anything like that, there are submission deadlines. For example, the Edmonton Music Awards aren't until next June, but on Friday they take their submissions. So if we wanted to be involved in that, we would have had to have done it, you know, August, September, October, November, yeah, yeah. December. There's a lot of opportunities you didn't even apply for because you just assumed you were booked. Then. Absolutely. Right. We had zero gigs for January because we were supposed to leave January. Right. So that was... A, really hard on us. We went into the studio December 4th also to start our record, mm-hmm. which was... Was that just this past January? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Feels like an eternity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, to start our record, which we had spent six months interviewing producers all across the country, and we had written for grants to cover it. Like, we'd really, really done a ton of work. And so we go into the studio, find out that we're... I think, I think we found out we didn't get a grant, one of our grants, the first one we applied for, September. We got notification, and we didn't get that one. And then we go into the studio, and then we find out that our income for the whole next year is gone. And our, our influence, our exposure, all of that. Uh, so we, we had to keep like our spirits up while we were working on the album. And then also plan what the heck we're going to do with this album now that we had no tour to share it on and right. so everything. It was just crazy. Uh, so I'm not going to lie, we wanted to like stop doing music. Oh, yeah. It was huge. That's huge. Did you have serious conversations about like whether to like like take a break or just like do something else? Oh, or? yeah. We were like, well, what kind of work can I get? Like, I bet you I can go and do whatever random work or right. like maybe promote myself more as like a solo guitar player as right. a higher on or stuff like that just like take a break from doing yeah soapbox duo at the time at least relieve a little pressure from, from yeah and the, and the second thing about being an independent artist full time is that you you can't really afford any actual breaks because everything's based on momentum. Right. Exactly, um, and that was right. the thing. It's like, well, if we stop it's now, we, it's like, we, we oh, do this was a waste. Don't. Right. Yeah, and, and at that point, I would have to change gears, and I, like, I'm really passionate about, obviously, the prevention of child sexual abuse, and I was like, hey, maybe I'll work with victim services, or I'll go take courses, or I'll, you know, look at the legal system and how we can get involved in that, and that sort of thing, because... Like, I mean, we'll always do music, but did it need to be our job? Because it's hard. It's so hard. Yeah. So that took a toll, but you still decided to go into the studio, and here you are still eight months it. later. So what was, um, this is leading up to the rebrand and the name change. What was your decision process like? Like, no, let's stick it out and see what happens. With the name change. Oh, just like when you, yeah, in, Jan in yeah. January, you still go into the studio without grant money or we touring like, income. We have to do this. Like, we're, we're all in. Yeah. So. We had applied to a contest, the My United Way Voice contest, yeah. with a song that we had written right before we left to Haiti in October. And you, you had to apply by, like, November 5th or something. And uh, we filmed the song we wrote about poverty in Haiti. Um with our director friend because we were right. there anyways and so we're like hey we'll just do a quick acoustic version of this and, and submit it and so over that period we found out that we were selected as top 10 by jurors and then and then we were going into a voting season in, in December for top 5 or 3 something I like think that. it was top 3 top 3 um and so we were like, well, we're in this contest, and, and the value of that contest was about 30000 Um It's about 10000 um, in a, a vehicle, which is brand new, and you get the lease for two years, and then 5000 cash for your career, and then 5000 in... It was supposed to be a demo deal, but um, ended up being marketing for us, which was right when we did the transition with the brand. So what happened is, yeah, we were... We were still doing that so we were talking to people about because they were always asking us about the contests and stuff and when we would talk to them about like how discouraged we were to share our story they were just like no like your music has meant something to me and like you guys are totally made to do this like please don't stop doing this and so we had a lot of those conversations over that period which was helpful um and i think once we made the mental resolve that we were just going to make it work we just got busy again, like got busy getting stuff done and making things Learning happen Learning so ourselves. many things. It was just, it was so crazy, you guys. This is the weirdest year. So we go into January. Yeah. And like we, we ended up booking a gig, which we had canceled because we were supposed to be on tour. Like somebody had asked us for the, it was a whole weekend thing. And they were like, can you do it? And we're like, we're going to be on tour. We can't do it. So I got a hold of them. I said, Tour's canceled, can I come and do this gig still? Did you book something else? They're like, come. So we drive out, it's about four or five minutes away from where we are in, in the middle of nowhere country at a camp. And so we drive our car out there and on the way, and it's 
middle of winter, Alberta, freezing cold, lots of snow, bad roads, and uh, a group of deer run across the road, and we hit this massive buck in the in the hip, and a car, the car starts fishtailing everywhere for about maybe 250 meters. Oh my God. Um, Alexander was able to maintain control, which is quite amazing because, and we had a all we those video all games of drifting cars. They yeah. Find <laughs> <laughs> Told you, mom. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth it. So worth it. Uh, but yeah, so we're like losing control and the cars everywhere and we had all the gear with us. He's able to stabilize it. We get out of the car. The whole front end on the, on the drive side is just eaten away. and uh, We end up driving it t- to the gig a little bit late, obviously. And uh, we drive back home and find out that we shouldn't have driven it because it's like this sort of type of damage on the inside and it's a write off and we have no car. We only have one car because we live very frugal to make our music career work. Right. Um, so our only other vehicles are touring van, which is from 1981 and awesome. it's the middle of winter and it's got like Summer tires and really Old, bad visibility. Old trusty man, that yeah. vehicle in the dead of winter will start. So we're like, great, now we're driving this camper van to wherever. And we're in this contest and one of the prizes is a car. Yeah. And so we're like, <laughs> we, we don't have any games we this. <laughs> right we have now. To win. We have to win. We have to win this. And, and it was like, the last segment it was about like votes, yeah. like to get into the top three I by mobilizing fans. Yeah. yeah, so we were like, "I bought it for you." How the heck? You oh, did. Oh, you yeah. did. Thanks, I did. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so cool. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we're like, well, well, "What do we do?" So we spent a lot of time figuring out how to like get people to know that we're doing this thing. Yeah. And I think like a week. The, the voting happens to get us into the top three. So then we made top three, which was really exciting for us. Yeah, and they give you like an extra, they give you a free suit and you get free photography. Wow. So oh, it's yeah, pretty sweet. It's still something, yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah, so at that point we were still excited. And then we were going to get a showcase at like a big event uh, with like 800 people. And a lot of them are like dignitaries and They're like the people in Edmonton people. who like have huge businesses and like run the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and lots cool. of non profits, lots of television personalities and, and the mayor and all that stuff. Good people to have on your side. Yeah. Totally. And good people to meet and all that oh stuff. Oh my goodness. And then something else happens. Three days before we perform, Jen wakes up. She's like, she can't even sleep actually. She's like, man, I'm in so much pain. My, my, like something inside of my body hurts and she can't sleep. She's like, no, something's wrong. We should go check it out. Turns out she has that appendicitis. appendicitis. Oh no. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Alexander, we, we had the rehearsal for this big thing with a full band, like string section and everything. So I'm just like at the hospital. And this is like the re- top three showcase. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he's at this rehearsal with his <clears throat> band and I'm not there. And I sang that whole song. Like it was in a key for my voice. Like he wasn't even singing on that one. So I'm like um, leaving the band. I'm like, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> oh, and, no. and, I promise she knows it. So <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know that he doesn't know how uh, appendicitis yet. I'm just at the hospital. Yeah. So he left me and my brother came to me and he went to this rehearsal and I was supposed to sing back up and he was supposed to play guitar on somebody else's show right after that rehearsal. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in the hospital. He goes to the show, sets up all his gear and, uh, the, the surgeon comes in and like right away he knows he's like, you need to go into surgery. Uh, like get ready right now. It's going to be between 20 and 40 minutes and you'll be under. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So I call Alexander. I I'm like, like, I'm going in surgery in like 20 to 40 minutes. And he's like, okay, I'm coming. So he comes, leaves the gig, comes to the hospital to, to see me like literally gets there maybe two, three minutes before the, it was so we cinematic. Yeah. Running down the hall. And Wait, like, that's my wife! <laughs> I love him. I hope this is a goodbye. Uh, yeah, so then I, then I had surgery that night. And uh, you stay overnight and all that, whatever stuff. And then you're not supposed to, like... I told the surgeon, I'm like... I was like, I have something, like, a really important performance on Thursday. And, like, like am I going to be ready 
but am I going to be good to go? And he's like, I'll write you a note. And he walks out of the room. I'm like, it's not a like, doctor's it's not notes. Like that. I, yeah. I work for myself. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not asking permission from the principal. I'm like, yeah. will I die on stage? Right. He's like, and then we, as I'm cool story, as I'm okay. going into the operating room, um, there, oh, yeah. I had to ask for like a smaller intubation because your vocal folds are really sensitive and it can cause a lot of issues. People have had like almost permanent damage from that before. Yeah. And so I was aware of that. So I was telling like the nurses that were prepping me, I was like, I'm a vocalist professionally, you know, please bear that in mind with this whole situation. And they're like, oh, you play music? Like, play music. And they're wheeling me into the operating room and there's like five of them and they're like strapping my arms down and stuff. It's weird. Um, <laughs> and like, you know, making X's on my abdomen and stuff. And all this time they're just asking me like about my music and they go, somebody behind me, I don't know, they got some speaker system in there and they start playing, uh, Complexion. Mm-hmm. Uh, One of your of, guys' songs. Off yeah. of YouTube or something. Uh, and they literally put like the mask on me, like count backwards and there's like Complexion playing, uh, as a, that's like, crazy. <laughs> yeah. Which was cool, and then when the surgeon came to see me the next day to see how I was recovering, he's like talking about my music and stuff because he realized like then that I was, that I was actually like, a singer professionally. Yeah, kind of got what I was talking about. So that all happened. I'm thinking, what the heck do we do? We're, we're thinking maybe we change the key and Alexander takes it over or whatever. I, mean, I practiced the whole thing. I was ready to go. Yeah, and we had the new charts, double pack ups, and. And then we got a wheelchair because she knows someone with a wheelchair. And I'm wheeling her around all day because she did, you she just had surgery, yeah. so she can't like really move. Yeah. And like singing takes all your core muscles. Right. My physiotherapist like literally taped my abdomen yeah. like inward, and then wrapped it with a big tensor. And I had like a keyhole in my dress that for the event, and it's just tensor bandages underneath. Oh <laughs> this looked funny. <laughs> so uh, we go to this gig, I'm wheeling her in, and we're like, still like wondering, should I like sing this song or are you gonna do it? She's like, I'll just like, I'm just gonna do it. I'll just do it, my best. So our time comes to perform and I wheel her up to the stage and she like gets up and like starts walking like a normal person, sings, crushes it, gets off stage and like instantly buckles over into her wheelchair. Oh my She's, like, God. Did the audience know this? Like, no did one you knew. Get, oh like, man, nobody like, knew. A movie. <laughs> yeah, it is like a movie. If he, if he like wheeled you out and then you like stand up like a mer- like. Mm. She uh, can walk. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, so nobody knows. Now. That's amazing. And people come up after they're like, "Why are you in a wheelchair?" And we have to tell this whole story. And they're like, "Wow, I didn't even know." And the voting started at eight a.m. Yeah. I would have known that. And then. We didn't perform till like 7 p.m. and it stopped at 8. So a lot of the votes were already in Cast. by oh. the time we did the by the time we did the performance, anyways. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like solely based on on that. Like, but that the was, whole room votes and there's like 800 people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So there's that difference. But I think we were. I think there were 20,000 Twitter votes over the day, and I think we had more than 20,000 because we had like my family. All five of them and some of her family just like voting like crazy yeah to help us win nice. <laughs> like people that had the day off of work or school or whatever just sat and voted all day like they just wrote weird stuff and like that's awesome about it so yeah that was a huge blessing for us because like no car we got this car no money we got money yeah and then uh, we got a whole package like a recording package yeah we already recorded in the studio so we're talking with the planet sound the promotions company and they're like well you shouldn't do the recording package why don't we do like a promo package and we've been talking about changing our name they're like we'll just do like a whole name rebrand for you and they did this whole package to help launch our new name wow which was so valuable because there's so many things that we had to change we need new pictures new website New social media, new everything. Yeah. Okay, to buy all the domains again, and you have yep. to go register your business, and you have to. It's thousands of dollars of. So work. having a team help us do that. So they knocked it all out for you. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, we worked together. It was pretty sweet. It was a hard decision to make too. Like we had a focus group. And they had a whole bunch of names. Yeah, they pitched a bunch of stuff. 
to us, including my name, like the Genesia thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, which we were pretty adverse to initially. I wanted it because it's like, yeah, it's a solo name. It's just her name. But like the duo thing was such a problem. It's so much easier when you can attach to a name or a picture. Yeah. When you post pictures on Instagram, it's the selfies, the faces yeah. that gets the most likes. Right. Even solo faces get crazy traction compared to like a picture of your guitar or anything like right. that. Yeah, for sure. People connect with the name, they connect with the face. So I wanted it to be her. Cause she's the lead singer anyways. Right. We're still a duo, sure, but well, she's the one singing. The RJ from Planet Sound convinced us that like we can brand you or you can brand yourself as a duo with all your visuals and with the way that you cho- choose your logo and all that kind of stuff so that it it is clear it's not just me, right? Because that's right. what I was, I was concerned about. Like, I was like, I don't want this. This is my new solo project. And like, right. you get a record company and they're going to push you out. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Britain's Got Talent. Yeah, yeah. Drop the husband. Yeah. <laughs> and all the, f- just previous fans and family members just being like, because I have a more dominant personality. Yeah. I was like, oh my I hate it. So many people were like. him and was like, oh, I'm just my name now. <laughs> how, how do you feel like being kind of pushed out? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm monster a monster wife. Yeah. 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 And we're still like 50% writers on everything that we do. And yeah. we do all our shows together. I never play by myself. And like, I don't play with other guitar like players 50, 50. No. or singers. Like, he still sings on almost all the tracks. Yeah, right. What would we be without each other? I mean, yeah, like exactly. my guitar playing is very distinct. Yeah. yeah. It's very recognizable. So after you won the competition, was that kind of the revitalization that you needed? Yeah, we like we got this huge check, one of those big. <laughs> I pinned it to the wall, and we're like, we have to remember that we like our success. Is yeah, good. yeah. And so we're right up to kind of where the last couple months have brought you. And I know Jack is really curious. We went through a name change in the last. Uh, year and it was less dramatic. Oh, way less dramatic than, <laughs> than, than yours, but there was still like a lot of like uh, thought that has got into it, and so we're definitely well, like everything you've built is right. kind of for not right. right. And we were lucky that we were literally just starting out, so essentially it was irrelevant. It, like a name change was kind of you know the most. It was the perfect timing. Just cause how did it was... feel for you guys? Like, did you feel a little overwhelmed by it? I think I was a little more stressed, you know, because I, 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 some people who have like, you know, oh, who only tangentially pay attention to you on social media, like, I guarantee there's a handful of people who never notice. Oh, for sure. Because I, I think <laughs> for a while we kind of wanted to have it both ways, because we were last year Barton and Barton, yes. which my roommate came up with because he thought it was cause, like, a songwriting duo, like Gilbert and Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, most people thought it sounded like, like a, a law firm. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. and like it's it's a small thing, but people have to type the ampersand into Spotify to come up. Like oh, so that you couldn't just type Barton and Barton. It's like, small things. It's like, like little that. things that make you less findable. Uh, but I wanted to have it both ways because I really liked the branding of the of the brotherly thing. So all of our handles were still like the Barton Bros, but we are called Barton and Barton and I had like a music like coach consultant like really like my personal website as a composer and then the band website like I don't, I don't get this what is this and I'm trying to explain it and like I have a vision for it and it's like I don't get it and so we just kind of like alright I, I get it I get it it's early on and we're trying to think really like long term and maybe we can talk about this because we just have kind of gone through an unbranding of sorts we just <laughs> put out a record of solo piano like neoclassical oh. music and we were like do we get up with a separate artist name we are writing music for sync. It's right. like, all right, do like does like the folk songs that is we that, make. Is yeah, that a new artist? Stompy name? clappy stuff. Make it on Spotify. Yeah, it's yeah. like because you asked a question at the panel yesterday about writing uh, solo guitar versions of your songs. Right. Does mm-hmm. that need to be under a new artist name? And I I definitely get that because I, I care about uh, about branding. But when you think about the amount of work that you do maintaining one social media page much yeah. less like starting a new twitter account for this thing like, so like five okay, different projects yeah. what i'm like hopeful for even though this is like conventionally bad music marketing wisdom is that if we keep it under like a single artist name like yes a lot of people will stumble across our spotify page and be very confused but we're hoping that like the cross-section of people that like find us interesting as people 
and like, oh, that's really interesting. Like the people who it resonates with will hopefully really resonate right. with, and those are the people you want as you your want super fans. fans. And so that's what I'm like crossing my fingers for. Honestly, like any of our so like any of our true fans that really like our like duet stuff will probably like our classical piano music, and if they don't, yeah, like it's you. skip it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but like. Our brand is ourselves. Yeah, people find us, our, our social media, we try to keep it like pretty casual and personal. So I think people who identify with us and just like who think that's, in, these are interesting people to follow along. I don't like the pop song as much as I like that really nice sleepy piano song, but right. there, I'll keep following them. They seem nice. And if somebody isn't, isn't into the whole package, like just say goodbye. Because like we struggled with that too with the soapbox to a transition. Mm-hmm. It was like, what if you know, some of our current fans aren't, like, don't like the new music or they don't like what we look like anymore. Right, right. What if they were just super into that vintage thing and, like, we're still throwback. Mm -hmm. We still have elements of that. Definitely. But we're not boxed in by it. And so I just thought, you know, if there are people who are following us and they're not into following us through this, then, like, we might as well shed them now. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. Like, all right, well, thanks. I got paid for your streams and your iTunes downloads. Like, thank you for following thanks us for, for that time. time. <laughs> but, you know, if you don't want to follow along, like, you can't try not to be too offended. Yeah. So has it been no looking back since the rebrand? You guys feeling stoked about it? What's the so update on life? Well, we got a funny email. It wasn't meant to be funny, but it was funny to us. They're like, because we have Soapbox Duo and Genesi under under the same account, Mm -hmm. right, on Spotify. So we got an email here, like, are your followers this month for your your artists? And, like, Soapbox Duo had, like, 35 followers. And Genesi had, like, 4,000 followers. Oh, I think it was, was, yeah, streams or something like that. Streams, full of streams. So, yeah, one was, like, 4,000 streams, one was, like, 37 streams. Or, like, okay. All right, we did it. Time to turn. (laughs) We did it. We're doing good. And uh, we yeah we had to do so we had to pull stuff off of our old Spotify page. Oh, you did. Yeah, uh, because we had already released stuff on Spotify and we wanted to like put it back out because the music hasn't changed yet. The the stuff that we put out, but I like looked up as much as I could, crossing my fingers that we could keep some of the stats. And so since the titles stayed the same and I uploaded the same wave file, we kept our streams. <gasps> right, because the same IRS SC code, right? Yeah, but. Not the case with oh, my solo tragic. piano stuff. Had like sixty five thousand on it. Yeah, I put out some zero. The, <laughs> oh no! So, some of the tracks that I, I put 65, out sixty five thousand. That's incredible. Thank you. I last what? last year. I we were talking about transitioning out of day jobs. I had the exact like unicorn kind of situation you were saying where. I had this really flexible job that allowed me to like scale down to one or two days a week. Oh, nice! And so, like last November, I made that switch, and kind of like in oh, celebration that. of that, I wrote like some like really relaxing solo piano stuff like that, and just like threw it up there, and got a couple indie playlisters to to catch on. And so, yeah, through the year, like collected like you know sixty plus thousand on this song, and so That's I amazing. didn't keep those. That is but sad. still, I still have a. a I uh, still have connections to like those playlists. Hopefully, they'll like put us back. Totally. Up, well, this time's out well for us because we, um, because in uh, next week I'm quitting my job full time, and then he is going to be. I'm going to scale the rest of the two days all the yeah, way back. Yeah, so we'll be going full time. But would you guys like? What is your advice for what you've learned in the uh, time you've spent completely full time? Like, would you give what advice would you give to people that are in our position? I would say that make a schedule for yourself. Like, you don't have to stick to it concrete unless you're that type of person I'm not but like we have a schedule where we wake up and we dedicate our time by hour to a certain thing songwriting and like rehearsing like mastering your craft right. whatever instrument or voice and then we got like business doing social media one hour like meeting with people or doing like a podcast or something like this and we break it down that way so we know that things are getting attended to because we found we would spend all our time on the computer answering emails and doing business stuff and nothing towards our craft. So our craft suffered and we don't have like a crazy amount of new music anymore. You know, so just making sure that you're doing enough business and enough creative. Because mm-hmm. you'll just get overwhelmed with the business. Totally. The amount of stuff there is. Yeah, you could spend all day on Instagram if that's like, yeah. and call it working on the business if, yeah. if, if you don't. A friend of ours yeah. is reading a book and the book says spend six to eight hours on Twitter, following like 
being part of conversations every it's day. It's Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, I think it is. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, <laughs> I'm reading if I spend right eight it's hours awesome. a day on Twitter, what else am I going to do? Right. We're not, you know, we're wearing the hat of, of 10 people, basically, your mm-hmm. team. You, you're, you're, video, you're the right? publisher, you're and the recording. publicist, you're the, oh. you're the, uh, the artist, you're the band, you're the manager, you're the booking agent. Yeah, exactly. You're literally all those things. Not to mention, obviously, oh, digital marketing, you're whatever, Not videos, photography, whatever. Yeah. You're wearing all those hats, and so, yeah, it can... It can be annoying to talk with people who do like management and stuff. Like even someone like Rick Barker is fantastic. Um, he talks to us from his perspective. He's not doing any of the art. Totally. Like, well, you guys should be doing all these things. Yeah. Okay. Sure. But how many hours are there in a day? And then we have to also create, um, improve, refine, do the shows. You know. Like Absolutely. even gig, day, gig days for us, like if we're driving an hour to, to a gig and then you got to be there an hour ahead to set up and then you go to play for three hours and then you have to tear down and then drive back. That's a whole day's work for somebody. And we've done nothing on social media. Right. Because we've been gone the whole time. Right. And if you had a social media manager to document your amazing performance, it'd be one thing. Because right. like, oh my gosh, yes. like we're so active, but like all of a sudden... You're on your most active days, your show days, you're least active on social media because, like... You just can't do my it. My hands are tied. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess my biggest... My biggest suggestion, if you're, like, at the start, um, would be make sure you have a budget that you can quantify. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, write out a calendar. Well, how much are you making? What are your gigs? What... How... Because... 90% of what we make is going to be from our live performances initially, right? Yeah. So how are you monetizing that? And how are you making yourself valuable enough to increase your rate? Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think thinking like a business person is really helpful. Uh, like when you're approaching businesses, like if you're gigging at a restaurant or something, like understanding their restaurant, you know, they're selling food and, and beverages and what value are you bringing by being there that was a great thing that we learned it's like instead of just doing your thing ask the person who's booking you like what do you want from me you don't just assume that they want your music be like do you want me to sell a certain drink is there a special going on or like do you want me to advertise for something because you have the microphone everyone's going to be listening to you anyway so if you can like give them some real value they'll be like you know, they did what I wanted, and maybe they even exceeded my expectations. So then, absolutely, I'll promote you even more. Because yeah. everyone's only got so much money. Like if I was running a cafe, and then I've got to pay somebody to come in and play music, like what investment is that for me? And they won't think to ask you. Like they won't think to say, "Oh, promote my drink special." No, of course not. But sometimes, if you forget to do something, like like encouraging people to buy something else, or you know, we're all here, like, we run an open mic at a cafe. I'll often get up in between songs and just be like, we're super thankful to Brooks Coffee House because without them, we'd be in my living room and everybody laughs and stuff. And then I say, you know, please help yourself to some more food and drinks and whatever because the business has to make enough money to have us there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not just, that's not the only transaction. You're creating an environment. You're bringing value by, you know creating a unique experience for patrons. So like we're, we're not discounting that part of it. Um, but to, when you're first starting out, you don't have a name, you don't have something that's going to draw a bunch of people to somebody's right. restaurant. So that was helpful. And then, yeah, like just really breaking everything down. What can we save on? We literally would call our, our credit card company. We've called save all like our 10 bucks a month buyers. or something. Yeah. What can we get for cheaper? Um, to make things... Yeah, the small things add up, definitely. Oh, they Especially do. in the world where you're paying subscriptions, it's Netflix and Spotify. Yeah, totally. And then like, oh, now we need to get YouTube Music because you want to understand how the platform works, so you can... So you're paying all these subscription fees for your business. And then a lot of awards or like kind of union-style websites have like their yearly subscription fees. Memberships, yeah. Oh my goodness, the money just disappears. Oops. 
I would fully imagine. Well, before we run the risk of taking your whole day up, we should probably have you sing a couple songs, right? That'd be pretty nice. Is there anything else you wanted to cover? No, just, uh, you know, as a nice little uh, ribbon on it, is there, where would you recommend people go to find your stuff? Any exciting events coming up? What what shameless plugs do you have for, for <laughs> our millions of listeners? Well, um, the, after coming back from the conference that we all attended, yeah. I've decided to focus on three show, social platforms. So, like, Instagram is our big number one. And because Instagram is tied to Facebook, you can check out all, like, the Instagram stories on the Facebook story, and, like, all the posts are going to be there, too. And then we really want to grow our YouTube page, so we're going to try and start vlogging and putting something together in the next couple months. And Spotify, of course. Mm. You can find us at J-E-N-E-S-I-A on Spotify, and all of our social tags are Genesia Music. Nice. Beautiful. Nicely done. So, got time for a couple tunes? Yes, for sure. Awesome. What do you want to play? Another day is gone again. Too afraid to offend our friends. We play with ashes in our hands. Mm-hmm. Unconsented videos. Make their way into our homes They find their way around the globe In this small square of light It keeps me up all night It's got me fooled Why do I do what I don't want to? My eyes betray my body My soul is left in one scene Bobby Bobby 
Bonjour.